Those lights are crazy bright. All right. Uh, so before I get started, I definitely want to thank uh, David, uh, Anna, uh, everyone from the LXJS crew for uh, an amazing event. Uh, obviously, a developer-focused uh, event inviting a security talk. I absolutely love it and appreciate it uh, very much. Uh, I've gotten to have lots of talks with other attendees uh, on security topics, and it's been just a fantastic conversation. Uh, so, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Adam uh, Baldwin. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Adam underscore Baldwin uh, or uh, Evil Packet on uh, GitHub. <clears throat> uh, I am the Chief Security Officer at And Yet, uh, where I get to work on uh, basically securing uh, some pretty awesome products uh, like Talkie.io, uh, .io, uh, and Anbang. And uh, I am the team lead at Lyft Security, uh, where I get to help developer teams basically uh, improve their security posture, uh, audit uh, web apps and things like that. And the reason I'm standing here today is that I'm the founder uh, and organizer of the Node Security Project. And I'm, I'm basically a, a self-appointed cheerleader of security in the, uh, the Node community, right? Uh, I absolutely love this, uh, this community. You guys are... Uh, Fantastic. Uh, this talk uh, might have been better titled uh, The Random Sort of Babblings of uh, a Guy That's on Security for Far Too Long, and that's ADD. So um, hopefully I'll keep on track and, and uh, stay focused. Uh, most of the goals of my talks are not necessarily to disseminate technical security knowledge. Uh, it's usually, uh, I'm usually presenting to get you to think a little bit differently uh, and to uh, think critically uh, how you're doing security within your uh, in, in development. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Node Security Project's backstory, some successes, uh, some things I really screwed up in starting the project, uh, and hopefully weave in some lessons that you can take away uh, that will apply to sort of any uh, sort of dev environment. Uh, uh, anyway, um, so for, for those of you that uh, aren't familiar with the Node Security Project, uh, it's a community effort to audit all of the modules published on NPM. Uh, there's 40,000 plus modules at the moment. Uh, and we're trying to use this, uh, the data we get from that to enable developers to write more secure software, uh, to just be better. Uh, so along with auditing uh, modules, uh, we're going to provide educational blog posts, uh, references, uh, links to talks, papers, things like that, uh, things that can help you with your uh, everyday development life. Uh, imagine how cool it would be if NPM could, when you do uh, NPM install on a package, if it could tell you uh, if a module that, it's, that you're using has a, a known security flaw in it, or a dependency of a dependency of a dependency has a flaw. It would be freaking amazing. So I get this question asked of me a lot. Why was the Node Security Project started? And uh, back at And Yet, uh, we used to be a Django shop. And as we were transitioning uh, to be uh, basically to Node and started to build uh, and Bang, uh, I had to think about uh, the impacts, what were the security impacts going to be, um, and what would we face uh, <clears throat> as we built our products. Um, we had control over the code that we produced in-house. Um, we could do things uh, to make our code better. We could do pre-commit uh, hooks for linting. Uh, we had pull requests for peer review. Um, peer, uh, peer <clears throat> pull requests are a really great uh, way to disseminate knowledge and we think of them oftentimes as chores, but you can really take that as an opportunity, especially if you're the person on your team that knows about a security issue, to spread that knowledge through that pull request. It's, it's an education channel. It's really, really effective. Uh, it's one of the ways that we've uh, managed to spread security values and education through our organization at And Yet. Uh, and that's one thing that we do uh, have control over there as well. Things we didn't have control over. We didn't have control of other people's code, or the delivery system, NPM. And while it can be argued that they're open source, right? I can send a pull request, I can file an issue, we all know where that goes. Pull requests go unmerged, they sit there. Um, it's just not the same uh, as having, having that control internally. Uh, and I had, co I had high confidence in Node Core that it was small enough to be kept sort of under a watchful eye um, and issues will crop up, but user land, uh, NPM, was growing at an insane rate. I think uh, module count says it's like 99 modules per day or something over the last week, which is just crazy. Um, 
And uh, it's not that I didn't trust other developers, didn't trust them, it's just that we're people, we make mistakes. There was a very sort of low barrier to entry in getting into, in, into Node at, at that time, it still is, and you're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of developers that were used to working in the front end, they're now writing server code. They don't necessarily, the landscape's completely different. There's different uh, security issues to deal with in one side than the other. Uh, so when we started thinking about, or when I started thinking about this, uh, it led to sort of the discovery initially that the, the registry passwords, NPM passwords were, uh, the hashes were exposed. Um, and a lot of the passwords were easily crackable, four character passwords. All that were, was guarding me publishing to your module and uploading whatever I wanted. So take that as note one, if you're using a really uh, horrible password on NPM, update it please. Um, and then, and then we, got, we, got, we got that fixed. And, and then we added CSRF, cross-site request forgery protection to NPM, uh, dub, 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 and uh, to reduce the account of, uh, <clears throat> chance of account hijacking. So those were a couple of historical things we had done. Um, we wanted to do more. Um, you know, modules are the glue, uh, basically any app, any Node app is, is gonna be just a bunch of modules held together with glue code, right? That's the typical pattern um, uh, for a Node app. So, we, so um, let me just, uh, so anyway, modules, uh, you know, where there wasn't, when there were, where there wasn't modules, getting back to the point of um, that it was sort of green pastures and people were just sort of, uh, it's a low barrier to entry. We, uh, modules just pop up. There wasn't a module to do uh, X or Y or Z, so one module, two modules, 10 modules pop up to do said thing. And, uh, you know, maybe it wasn't, they weren't the right people to write the code, but they needed that, that thing there to do that. Um, and, uh, which is interesting though that, that we sort of just blindly install these modules from NPM. We say it does a thing, so we, we install it. Um, we, even, we even install modules that are built into core. So let's talk about some new research that I've done um, that I've only talked a little bit uh, publicly about. And it's still a problem. This is still technically uh, an issue in, uh, that's out there. I'm presenting it to the community because it's a community, uh, NPM to community thing. It needs to be solved by the community. We, there's plenty of people here that could contribute to fixing this issue. Uh, NPM install all the things. That is not a typo, uh, at least by accident. It's on purpose. So I got to the point where uh, I wanted to research um, if we were making a mistake between basically uh, as humans installing modules. What were common typos, uh, were, were these modules being installed from the registry? Would you normally do this? Do you think anybody does this, npm install fs? Most people would say no, that's a silly thing to do, it's built into node core. Um, or this, npm install http, or how about this, npm install socket io. There's actually supposed to be a dot in there. You'll get a 404 for every single one of those. They don't actually exist right now, but they could be published and they may not be the module or the intended behavior that you want. It could be a malicious module. Um, it could be something that mimics the behavior of a module, but has a malicious counterpoint. Uh, so I, took, I did an experiment. I, I, I passively analyzed basically all of the logs looking for um, if people did these things. I, so I got the, the logs from the NPM project. And over about a period of three quarters of a year, 15,000 people tried to install FS. Yeah, a lot of people. Um, HTTP was also high on the list. Those modules still don't exist. Uh, however, it's becoming sort of like, there were these modules published just a little while ago, a couple days ago, and I noticed they got taken down. Uh, somebody basically was just trolling the registry by publishing some of these things out there that did nothing. Um, just m module exports. Uh, nothing, but those actually got taken down. So it, it, it is a problem. Um, I published uh, CoffeeScript, not Coffee-Script, but CoffeeScript, uh, and I got 200 downloads in a week, and the module did nothing. Um, had it mimicked the behavior of actual CoffeeScript, it might have gone unnoticed a lot longer. So I'm not sure, 
uh, self-policing is in the community is enough, but I, I, I really just want to get that out there um, to get the dialogue going about this problem. Conclusions I had were uh, core modules basically shouldn't be, uh, they, sh they shouldn't be allowed in NPM, right? Like we should have some block there or, or something or some placeholder, I don't know. There's, the core, core is important to keep, keep the integrity there. Uh, punctuation is hard. Modules that have punctuation in them are more often uh, to be, uh, you're gonna install a wrong module. So basically, we need to be sure that we're installing the proper things. That's, that's one of the, the, that I got out of it. That's, that's, if I want to own a node app, one of your node apps, one of your developers, I'm gonna go to the registry. That's the source of where I'm gonna go. Um, and I'm gonna try these techniques as an, as an attacker. Um, we've gone under the radar in the security community and I think we're gonna start, uh, that's gonna start to change here soon. Uh, we also need a, a way to uh, sort of manage integrity on NPM and prove that we're installing packages. That might be package signing. Um, uh, Apollo uh, Ijinx uh, has some ideas on package signing that, that might be effective. It might solve some issues. So combine, uh, sort of back on the why, that was just kind of an aside of one, uh, just these compounding reasons of, of why we started. Uh, so combine all of those sort of aforementioned things uh, with the fact that uh, the same vulnerabilities and security principles have, you know, on authentication, authorization, input sanitization, code versus data separation, those things have existed for years. Wait, they're not gonna go away. There, these, these, these problems, these same principles exist, and we need to, to um, basically, we, the, the definition of crazy is we, we do the same thing over and over again and expect different results, right? We can't continue to do the same thing over and over again in our, in our development habits and our, our, the way we build software and expect more secure software. We just can't. So we, we have to, something has to change. We have to stop traversing this Mobius strip and we have to, we have to get off. Um, and that was, that was where I was at in, in sort of why I was starting the Node Security Project. Something had to change, let's try something crazy. Let's bridge the development and security communities and try to think more positively and actually influence uh, the community as a whole to build more secure software. Uh, as an aside, I have a note here that's basically to, to say how much I love uh, this community, the JavaScript community, the Node community, for having such, uh, for the most part, a positive outlook, uh, embracing security, embracing uh, talks at conferences, embracing just doing things differently uh, than other communities that may have uh, a little more uh, negativity surrounding them. So kind of onto the how. This is the second question I get asked a lot uh, for the Node Security Project. And after the launch, I sort of Uh, went, oh shit, how am I gonna do this? I just said I was gonna audit all the modules in NPM. Now what? Right? That's a lot of things and it's growing at a really fast rate. Well, it turns out sort of the answer was uh, right in front of me and I learned this lesson uh, transitioning from uh, owning a security consultancy to be, being the CSO. <laughs> Apparently I just break things wherever I go. Uh, so, uh, I, as I, was, as I became the, the CSO at And Yet, uh, I got this new, this, I'd worked for And Yet for years, or with And Yet, and I got this new opportunity to just sort of, uh, I was like, I'm internal, I can affect change, things will just happen, and we can just change all of the things, right? Secure all the things, make policies, make developers do this and this and this and this, and it didn't work. And I had to, I had to realize that you can't just do that, you can't change all the things or do all of the things all the time, when it comes to security or pretty much anything, you have to just, you have to do um, incremental achievements. You have to look where you're at and say, you know, this is the thing we do over and over again, we do it poorly, we see this pattern, let's figure out how to make that go away. Let's figure out how to get better. Uh, and so distilled down to two words, it's just basically do better. That's, if you take nothing away from this talk, that's the measure, increment, do better. That's, there, solved. And the reason that is is because security is not a solvable problem. You can't, you can't be 100% secure. It's just not going to happen. So once you realize that and embrace that, you're going to uh, basically realize that you have to approach it that way. Um, 
you know, similar to, uh, we're doing the node security community, uh, node security project similar to sort of how the pyramids were built. Um, you know, with a bunch of people in the community, one block at a time. We're gonna do, <clears throat> basically we're gonna do it based on initiatives. So we're gonna pick one particular uh, security vulnerability, one particular pattern, we're gonna focus on it, we're gonna audit it across the code base, we're gonna, ha we're gonna automate that, and I'll go into our process a little bit later, and then we're gonna ratchet up. So once that's sort of gone and being checked, we're going on to the next thing, and the next thing. And as more people get involved, we can, we can do those faster. But we're a small team. Uh, we're actually an amazing team. This is our uh, contributor, this is our contributor page, basically, on the Node Security IO site. Uh, and there's a lot more people that are listed there because it's basically got a bug and it doesn't show everybody. But <clears throat> it's, uh, you know, some of those people, uh, Stephen, uh, Ilya, and Wes on the top row there, have been uh, instrumental in creating some of our tools in our initial version, uh, which is going to change, uh, and they're going to, uh, they're part of the core uh, that's gonna be accepting code contributions and stuff. Um, now, uh, we've also had a lot of community advisor, Michael uh, Rogers, uh, Nathan Fender from the Andiat team, uh, Daniel Shaw have been great advisors. They're also not uh, really listed there. But, I realized after I got going and we, we did all this that I did it wrong. So there's, there's some incremental things that we're gonna do at the, at the Node Security Project as well. And I had a really, <clears throat> I had a problem. And I solved it wrong, basically. The problem was I don't want people that I don't trust coming and signing up for this mailing list, this private mailing list, and basically coming for the free O days. Right? I didn't want them coming for the free vulnerabilities, which we had, and we had no way to sort of segregate them. We initially used just GitHub issues and a private mailing list. And <clears throat> we're gonna solve that um, basically through a new, new, new process. Um, and we, we have to, I want developers to be able to contribute. So I've, I've, I've been asked a lot of times, I don't know much about security, but I wanna be involved in the Node Security Project. I want to learn. So I think I've figured out a really interesting way to sort of combine the two. Uh, who here has heard of NodeSchool.io? A few hands. Okay, so NodeSchool.io is absolutely amazing and uh, I believe the artwork there is Substack and Brian Brennan was part of it. I don't know who all is involved. Um, but that started because of Streams Adventure that Max and Substack wrote. So if you don't know about Streams Adventure, uh, also, and I think um, you know, uh, Rod did a bunch for that as well. Um, it's a way of, of doing like exercises. You get an explanation of exercise and then you gotta write some code and get it verified. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to use that uh, process to sort of uh, connect developers with an education um, about the vulnerability and then they can validate it. And you can just pop stuff off of a, a stack. You can see only the things that you have worked on. You can't see all the rest of the things. Um, and we can keep track of who's done what and it segregates the work. It educates developers uh, and it sort of meets all of our goals. Um, so here is our new process basically with lots of little icons. So uh, people basically feed the machine, right? We've got a core security team uh, that is coming up with new things or people report them publicly. That's another thing that I really wanna uh, get supported is I wanna get, uh, if you have a security flaw in a library, report it. It does, it does good for the community. A lot of people hide those things and just fix it silently and push a new version out and it's, it's gone. <clears throat> Let's get that intel. Let's actually get some good data about, uh, about what's going on in our, in our modules and the, and the type of quality of code that we're building. So we feed the machine. Um, one way we do that by uh, searching, we've got a full text index that, of all of the source code uh, from NPM. So uh, whenever a new module's push, it gets updated. We can do quick searches across uh, who's using childprocess.exec. Uh, in, a, in a really horrible way. And we can, we can look across and say, is this a good pattern? Is this, is this gonna have a lots of false positives? Um, of course, we can tune those things. Um, we, uh, that's the job system in the whole COD thing. It's a Redis-based job system. 
Uh, on uh, the Node Security GitHub page, github.com slash node security, there's three repositories that are very empty right now because I'm basically moving all the code that was private and closed source because uh, basically I did it wrong. Um, and it's going to be open in in there, and anybody contribute, send pull requests, et cetera. That job system is up there. Very simple plugin structure. Um, you can do, you basically do anything. If you want to do a grep, uh, you're just doing a grep for a string, uh, which might be enough. You can do that. Uh, we've got uh, creates new tick, basically tickets in the system. It's just a web app. Uh, people pop tickets, so any developer can pop a ticket off that stack. Uh, basically, look. Uh, go through that exercise, learn the background of that particular issue, and get uh, knowledge about a security, uh, security flaw, which then hopefully if you're then reviewing other code of peers, that ends up you know, spreading itself and that grows uh, organically um, throughout our community. Uh, let's see, then we communicate with the developers. Uh, this turns out to be a really, really, really hard part about uh, uh, with the project is that every single project in here wants things done a little bit differently and communicated a little bit differently and they use different ways of uh, working with each other. Uh, more on that in a little bit. Uh, we fix the things, uh, full, do pull requests. We don't ever publish an advisory, uh, which is the last step. Uh, we don't ever do that without having a fix available. So that's, that's one thing is, is we're, we're very focused on having positive interaction with developers and we don't want to basically screw anybody over. That's sort of one of our core values. This slide's not supposed to be in there. So anyway, if the, even if the no security project fails to sustain, we're going to end up fixing a few things. Uh, even if it doesn't sort of produce a resource that helps you in your everyday life, um, in one of your modules, uh, it can still still be of use. You can take that lesson of just sort of increment and do better, and and realize that that uh, uh, even these you know random projects out there that that people um, really think are a good idea, and, and I've got a lot of compliments and a lot of followers on the Node Security Project. Uh, we still do things wrong, and we're we're okay admitting that, and we're just going to increment and do better. Uh, you can take that away. Process habits are not um, like code uh, are not immutable. They can change. We can simply do better. Um, so uh, with that, uh, to be sort of that seed within our environment um, and be the spark, we're going to uh, sort of see some things that we can do, very specific things we can do to be a catalyst for change. So improved resources. Uh, the reason why a security education sort of fails to be disseminated to developers is because uh, a lot of security people are not developers. And so we write uh, as security people, we write documentation and tools and things that are designed for us, not developers. And so what happens is, is that sucks for developers. Uh, what we need to do is make that better. So what I really, really want uh, people to do is go read some of the resources out there that are better for developers, such as the OWASP Top 10, OWASP.org, uh, and tell the Node Security Project uh, what sucks about it. What what do you not get out of that resource that we can fix and publish and fix, fix those things uh, and we can, we can publish new documentation uh, and make it better? <clears throat> the next thing is, as I talked about communication, right? We need a good uniform way of communicating uh, security issues and dealing with that privately. So that's private issues and pull requests. Um, so a little group exercise. Um, I want everybody to take out their phones, take out Twitter, and we're going to tweet at GitHub. Because uh, it, this would be great to get like 300 tweets at GitHub. Uh, basically, I wish GitHub had private issues and pull requests for open source projects to improve responsible disclosure for security issues. Uh, we don't have to have random email addresses where things go to or some out-of-band channel. We're using... GitHub, and we're using uh, issues, and we're using issue trackers, uh, we need the ability, we need the tools to support the processes that we're doing. Uh, you can use that link down below also uh, to get to like a quick texty thing. So I'm going to do that right now. So yes, you have to wait for me. 
<laughs> I should have had this already typed in. Poor planning, I guess I'll do better next time. NSP node security project. Everyone is crushing the Wi-Fi right now, so it's not going. Ah, okay, well you guys can all be my proxies and do it for me, because that's not working. So, do that, that'll be awesome if we can get that. Cool. Nodeschool.io, amazing, amazing, amazing project. Go out there, learn from it, contribute back to it. Uh, I would love for anything you learn from uh, OWASP or anything you know, security knowledge, go build a workshopper. Go contribute a thing to that, because it's awesome, and you will you'll learn a lot, and you will help a lot of people understand security vulnerabilities or whatever other type of workshopper you want to create. It's amazing. The last thing is, until we get the thing from GitHub or get better tools there, we can sort of augment, we can, we can put our security process for our projects in a place, security.md. You can put how you want to be communicated about your security vulnerabilities. It might simply be an email address. It might be a detailed process, uh, much like the Ember uh, JS project has. If you want a good example, check out the Ember uh, JS uh, security disclosure process. Uh, it's, it's, it's a model for, for how we can uh, improve things. Um, so do that. Uh, check us out on github.com slash node security and, and help. Uh, I am a developer and I'm a security person. I'm a bad developer. I write really slow, I, I just write code in it very poorly. So I need help. Uh, I do have a vision, I'll get some documents out there for what we're kind of looking for built, uh, to get built. But I know there's a, amazing people here that could contribute very quickly, much faster than I can, and do it in a much better way. Um, so uh, with that, I'm done. <laughs>